Welcome, welcome, welcome to Govern 2.0. It's going to be a great day. My name is Katrina Cannon. I'm the Workforce Diversity Manager with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And we just want to welcome you. Um, but without further ado, we have a wonderful MC, Mr. Daniel Jude. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to play the same trick that Katrina did. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good morning. I can't hear you. Oh, good morning. Hey, I'm a recovering high school English teacher. I can do this all morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, I am so thrilled that you're here. Thank you for joining us today. So glad that you've made uh, an investment in your own learning because I think we're all gonna hear things we haven't heard in ways we haven't heard yet this morning from folks that we uh, bring onto the stage today, but also that you've made an investment in your community, whatever that means to you and whatever that looks like, whether that's uh, literally the way we think about communities and neighborhoods and cities, or whether it's the community of folks that you're trying to work with to make the places you lead influence and impact more inclusive and equitable for everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank the mayor, uh, Mayor Ginther's office and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for putting on this event. Without, this, uh, without those teams, uh, this event would not happen. So grateful to them. Lots of gratitude for our speakers and moderators. The folks that you'll see uh, up on stage today are some of the best of the best. We feel really lucky to have gotten some of them here. We had to trick some of them to get them here, but they're, they're all gonna be here. We're crossing our fingers that they all show, and we're so excited for who we, we uh, have been able to deliver on stage today. Also, I just wanna say thank you quickly to the venue and the support staff, service staff, um, and all of the other volunteers and folks who've, who, who've made all of the things happen, happen. There's so many moving parts. For those of you that organize events know, there are so many moving parts, and um, they don't get moving without lots of helping hands. And so thank you to all that are helping and supporting this morning. My name is Daniel Jude. Uh, I'm local here to Columbus. Um, I own um, a, a firm or a shop or a company, but it's just me, so don't worry. Um, uh, and I do uh, work, education, speaking, and facilitating around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, organizational culture, and leadership development. So uh, I love the work I do. I feel so, so lucky to get to do what I do with organizational leaders, schools, districts, uh, universities, and, and companies, leadership teams, and so forth. It's an awesome uh, work to be involved in, and uh, I'm so grateful to be here with you this morning to do it. I want to tell a quick story to frame uh, our day uh, today, and then, and then I'm, I want to get out of your way. It's 1930, okay, in Great Britain, UK. It's 1930, and we're still in the height of colonial power, right? The colonial powers that be, the European colonial powers, uh, have amassed huge uh, colonies <laughs> that they have uh, invaded and now own, and they're looking for ways to sustain and solidify their colonial powers in far reaches of their empires. And airships are the way that they're doing it, right? Airships, when you think like blimps kind of thing, right? Big, big bags full of lighter than air gases and large cargo vessels uh, beneath them. And they have discovered that they can transport uh, man, uh, manpower and goods to and from the farthest reach of, reaches of their colonial empire easier with airships than any other tools available, right? They can go as the crow flies. They're not, they're not married to, to ri rivers or roads. Um, and these airships can carry massive payloads. And so there's a lot of work going into the airship industry. And in 1930, Great Britain launched their latest and greatest, biggest and best. It was called the R101. And the R101 took off. And if, if you were on the ground watching the R101, it would look like it was sort of gracefully floating down for a landing. But it wasn't graceful. If you were on board, you'd be frantic, right? It was chaos because some of the, he or some of the hydrogen sacks inside the R101 had burst. And they were crashing. And the R101 crashed uh, because it was filled with hydrogen, exploded, and killed most of the people on board. And at that time, Great Britain said, uh, we're done. Air this is not going to be our thing. Airships don't work. The danger level is untenable. We can't do this. And they scrapped their airship program. But not everyone was done with airships. And a German company bought the wreckage of the R101. They sent men up to uh, the wreckage site, and they scoured the wreckage site for any usable parts they could. And they loaded those into trucks and trains and took them back to, to Germany. And they built their next latest, greatest, biggest, and best airship. 14 months later, it was launched, and soon after that, crashed and killed nearly everyone on board. The name of that one was the Hindenburg, right? It was the Zeppelin company out of Germany that came up and bought the wreckage of the R101. 
And it's tragic, and I don't mean to make light of it. It's not I ironic like, ha ha, how ironic. It's, it's tragically ironic, right? The way that we often, even us, scour the wreckage of a past disaster, of things that we already know don't work, and we go back and we pull little parts and pieces out of it, and we say, well, we'll just cross our fingers. We'll try again. Maybe it'll work next time, right? And in our pursuit of better, we often continue to scour the wreckage of the past because innovation is hard, right? Figuring out what's next is really hard work, and it feels easier to go back to what was and just take some of that and try, over, try again, start over. And today, we're going to try to move away from the wreckage of the past, whatever that means to you in the ways that you show up in the world and the way that you do your work today. And we're going to try to look toward the next. We're going to wrestle with some big conversations and some big topics and try to figure out how do we avoid repeating the disasters of the past and how do we actually carve out a new future for our cities and our communities? What does better actually mean? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? And how do we get there? That's our journey for today. You on board? Good. We're not going to crash and burn. <laughs> We're going to do this, right? OK, I want to uh, give you a quick trajectory of the event. We've got an incredible uh, keynoter that I'll introduce to you in a moment, and we've got three panels. And the trajectory of our conversation for the day is kind of starting at the top strategic thinking level and working our way toward individual actions, behaviors, and decisions. So we'll start with big, broad conversations. And by the time you walk out of here today, you'll be thinking about specific ways of being and doing to make our cities and communities better places for everyone to live, work, and play. And you're going to meet some incredible leaders today, not perfect ones, but powerful ones, ones who are sitting in intersections of decision making and working hard to figure out what does next look like. That's the perfect segue for me to bring up Director Demita Brown. She's the director of the City of Columbus Office of Diversity and Inclusion and our city's chief diversity officer. Director Brown is uh, quite possibly one of the most strategic thinkers I know, but she's also one of the most thoughtful and gentle people I know which is a combination that's often hard to come by. And I've been privileged to get to work alongside her and her team on lots of initiatives, this, this event included. So would you please join me in welcoming Director Demita Brown to the stage. You can do whatever you want. You're the boss. I'm going to stay down here because I don't want to risk the stairs. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome you this morning on behalf of our mayor, Andrew Ginther, to Govern 2.0. So you wonder, what is Govern? Govern was, des oh, sorry. Govern was designed uh, to really create a space for public sector HR and DNI professionals to come together to learn, explore, innovate and re-energize. How, how many of you are in the DNI space or HR space? It's hard work, isn't it? And some days you feel like you have more losses than you do wins. Well, today is about a win. It's about how we come together and begin to think about how this work plays out on a more global landscape, our community how it plays out in terms of how we create policy that is intended to be equitable and justice for all, right? And then we're gonna walk away with some tips and tools of how we can take that work back to our respective places and begin to create that impact or continue to create that impact. It's hard work, but I hope that what you'll see today is that you have a number of people around you who share in that journey and will walk alongside you Daniel Jude is one of the most, the best and most honorable folks I've met and worked with in terms of our DNI space. He's a coach, he's a mentor, he's also a strategic thinker, but he really gets it. And he helps us to find the path forward when we struggle to just get up in, in the morning and continue through the day. So I want you to be that for each other today, to think about those, those things that you've experienced those uh, losses that we've had in the past or the ruins of some of the past mistakes or things that didn't go quite so well. I want you to lay that to the side and begin to pick up new pieces to your tool belt, new friends along the way, um, and a community of folks that will help you to bring it all together. 
That's what Govern 2.0 is. It's our intentional act of coming together and creating a community of supporters that will bring us all to a place of creating and continuing to create impact for the long run. Our communities need it, our children needs it, and our futures depend on it. So we're depending on each and every one of you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to bring Daniel back. I'm gonna get out of the way and let the keynote come up. Um, but thank you and I hope you enjoy the day and I look forward to connecting with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Director Brown. Um, for better or for worse, I'm your MC today. So I'm so sorry. You're going to see a lot of me. I'm running all the transitions. Uh, happy to do it, but uh, I'm sorry if you're not happy about it. Um, I want to bring up our keynote speaker, uh, Paloma Medina. She is uh, here all the way from the West Coast, and we're so honored that she flew in for this morning's conversation. From working with industry giants like Etsy and Squarespace to founding her own retail store to the TED stage, Paloma Medina blends neuropsychology, a deep understanding of organizational performance improvement, and a quirky sense of humor to support leaders on their journeys toward building high-performing and life-affirming workplaces. Please welcome with me to the stage, Paloma Medina. I did the stairs. We're good. OK, uh, so as they kind of bring up my slides, so I want to say I, am, I get to be in front of a lot of really lovely people. That's one of the best parts of my job. Uh, but I also, oh wait, I know they're waiting for me. But I was looking and talking to the organizers before, and yes? Yes? Doing it? Cool. Yeah, there we go. Uh, at who is in the room right now? And it's just a deep honor. Um, I know the work you do. Uh, I know a little bit about it. Uh, really, really honored to be in front of you talking, because we all have a piece of the puzzle. And I just have a little nerdy piece of it. And I hope it might be helpful to you today. So. I, uh, I started this journey about 10 years ago, really this part of the journey. Mm. Uh, as a performance improvement coach, I would be uh, handed or assigned a community healthcare team. So a team of medical uh, assistants, nurses, doctors, who for whatever reason were not meeting their deliverables, their grant deliverables, and they're going to lose their grants. And I had like six magic months to just like turn it around. I'd never met them before, and they were like, do it. So that's where this journey started, was with me being like, what? Wait, six months to do something that incredibly smart people haven't figured out yet because these folks are nurses, doctors, right? They know their field. And so of all the things I was learning to bring back to the teams to how, you know, coach them, when I started on my own reading about psychology, work psychology, re regular psychology, not a psychologist myself, no degree in it formally. When I started reading about it on my own and bringing that back to the teams, that's when all of a sudden the magic did start happening. Not because of me, but because when I shared that with folks. So I hope this hour together maybe might be helpful in that way for you all. And so in, the, in your book, you grab it. There's a page with my face on it. Because this isn't going to be also a regular kind of keynote. Speaking of psychology, I know how brains work a little bit, and I know that they'll want to be engaged, besides how entertaining I might be. So we're actually going to have a lot of reflections throughout it. Time for your brain to actually reflect. Yes. Now, there. Cool. So let's start with this one. I want you to think about a moment when you felt really good at work. And in particular, what were the details that made that moment great? What were the details that made the moment great? And I want you to write it down. You don't have to share it with anyone. You won't be talking about it if you don't want to. And it can be any moment. It could have been this morning. It could have been years ago. Something that stands out to you. Take a moment for that.
So just a few words so that you know. Okay. Everyone have a few thoughts down? Because I want this to be your case study. As we talk about psychology, your brain will do a lot better, synthesize it and remember it better if you have your own personal case study to like compare it to and be like, is that true? Is that true? Is that line up for me? So this is going to be your case study, whatever you wrote down. Because when I started, one of the first things that I learned was essentially basic brains 101 stuff, two parts of the brain that we're going to need to know about. The PFC, which is the prefrontal cortex. Who knows what the prefrontal cortex does? Ooh, store new information. It does a little of that. Yes, yes, yes. Any other guesses? It just helps me know, like, how nerdy are you about this? Because then that way I can skip over some parts. You just, you're like, just tell me, what is it? The prefrontal cortex is right behind her forehead. So uh, really right behind her forehead. And it is rational thinking. Some people think of it as her best self. Because when you were involved in a really complex problem-solving moment, it was your PFC doing the heavy lifting. It was really doing a lot. So any complex, rational thinking, that's your PFC. Magic. So thankful we have that. But the other part that we want to know about is the amygdala. Part of the limbic brain. Oh, you're excited. I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> because the amygdala, part of the limbic brain, so you might hear me interchange those, that part of the brain is the oldest part of the brain. And it's the oldest part because its main function is to scan constantly, even when we're asleep, looking for threats or rewards, mostly threats. It's there to keep us alive. It's at the center of our brain, because again, it's the oldest. It's like developed first. We share it with most animals. So this is important because if the amygdala is scanning the environment and is like, no major threats here, it allows the PFC to stay online. It allows it to stay online, i.e. it is in charge. And this is helpful for survival because say that it's scanning the environment and there's a bear over there in the corner or like a rustle. Back in cave people days, this mattered. The rustle way off in the distance, the amygdala within a half a second was like, what? Mm? Ready. Had we only had a prefrontal cortex back then and we heard a rustle off in the distance, the PFC would be like, oh, that sounds like a large animal. I wonder what kind, maybe it's a bear. Oh, it could be a mama bear because it's springtime and then we're dead. <laughs> because it's just so curious. <laughs> Luckily, our amygdala has evolved and we are all, right, the people that benefited from the evolution that the amygdala is like, there's a threat. And so even though this little red panda even though, in theory, the PFC is like, well, we do cool tricks, we don't need cool tricks right now. We just need to fight, get a spear, run up a tree. And so it does something called an amygdala hijack. Because there's such a significant threat, I'm going to hijack the ship and turn the PFC straight off. off. So you get, I'm going to let you see that again. Oh, it's going to loop. Totally normal animal, acting rational, Instant threat, freaks out. <laughs> Nothing new here, it's the handler that comes in every day to feed them. And it just like, some of us have had these moments where everything's normal that morning and then someone says something. And we're either like this buddy, <laughs> but we also might turn into what I call angry panda mode. How about I don't get sued because I really love this video. Can you see? <laughs> I think he's mad at the computer. It's so old. People, some of you might not know, that's a computer on that desk back in the day. A computer. That's it, on the left. OK. And then some of you might not know that's a phone, also on the left. That's a phone. So some of us, when we get triggered or amygdala hijack, we might go into angry panda mode. Some of us, however, might go into freeze. And freezing isn't, right, in the modern workplace, there might be a meeting, and on the outside, you look like this. You all know this face. You've trained to have this face. <laughs> but inside, you're either flipping a table over like Angry Panda, or you're just like, out. Lights are out. 
Because your amygdala, that's maybe how it's responding in that moment, because it got triggered. You also, however, might get teary -eyed. <laughs> I remember this little guy. <laughs> Perfectly happy, one second. She said the wrong thing. <laughs> Some of us get teary-eyed. All of it is the same thing, an amygdala hijack. Our brain's scanning the environment, saying whatever just happened is a threat to something important to me. The same. None of them are more emotional than the others. They're all just an emotional reaction, equal. So, I, poor little guy. OK. Here we go. So I started getting curious when I learned about those two things. I was like, one, it explains a lot about my past behavior and my coworkers' behavior and a lot of the behavior that I'm seeing on these teams, right, that to me seems irrational. But now I realize in that moment something must have happened for that nurse, for that doctor. And two, is it just willy-nilly? Like, will it just freak out about anything? Is it surprise? Is it, what is it? And it turns out that the brain is scanning for specific things very specific things. And it's not the ones that I was taught in like basic psychology one-on-one -on -one class. You all might know Maslow's hierarchy, right? Food, shelter, the basics. That's not actually how it works. Nobody told me that until I started reading on my own that in fact, all the newer research says, yeah, it's actually scanning also for six psychological emotional core needs. And one is not per se more important than the other. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to go through the six, and as I do that, one of them is going to deeply resonate for you, is my guess, and you're going to be like, oh, that's the word for the thing that matters to me. And some of them are going to be like, who cares about that? So let's discuss it, the six. The first one is belonging, inclusion. And by the brain scanning for it, um, we think of you know, belonging and inclusion often as like this warm feeling. Yes, also. But for example, in one of my favorite studies, they put some folks in front of a computer, like one person that was agreed to be part of the study. Um, I'm going to pick on you. You're like, damn it, why did I sit in the front-ish? Uh, I'll never pick on you again. The rest of you are targets after that, but not you. You're free after this. So let's say that you're part of the study, and I'm like, here's your computer you are going to play a game. If you win the game, you get 20 bucks. So win the game, right? Great. And the only part of the game is you're going to be playing against two other players who are in a room just like you are with their own computers. And you're just going to be tossing a ball back and forth to each other. If someone tosses the ball to you in the game and you don't catch it, you're out. The point of the game, you get the 20 bucks if you're the last one standing. If no one throws the ball at you, it doesn't matter. There's no points. Just be the last one standing. If they do throw it, catch it. You're ready to catch it, right? So she's ready, and she's like, OK, OK, OK. What, what that study subject didn't know is that there's two other people, say, you two folks, who are, you're playing you know, against her. You have your own. But you're part of the study. And so you have instructions that after a few minutes, you're going to just toss the ball back and forth to each other only and leave her out of the game. Jerks. <laughs> What should her, if we were only PFCs, only rational brains, what should her PFC be thinking at that moment when she's like, oh, I think they're leaving me out of the game? 20 bucks. Yes. Here I come. You, like, you're making it easy for me to get the 20 bucks. Instead, what they found is that 70 to 80-ish, depending on, you know, they did the study many times, of the subjects, the same part of their brain lit up as if they were experiencing physical pain, as if that person was being slapped. Same thing. In the past, we would, without this kind of studies, we would just consider ourselves irrational in that moment. How silly of me. But in fact, now we know, whoa, 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 this is deeply evolutionary. We use the same neural networks to scan for and respond to threats to our inclusion as threats to our physical safety. Same neural networks. They've wired together now. You can't tear them apart. So one, this explains a lot. How many of us um, have experienced or are close to people who give up food to be loved, who give up 
perfectly good shelter. When I worked in homeless services, one of the things that I remember first like scratching my head at was when I was like, here's a free, you know, here's like three nights at a shelter. Yay, you won the lottery today. We didn't have beds before, now we do. And the person was like, okay, cool, can, can my friends come with me? And I was like, no, they're just you. I, I got one bed. And they're like, we're good, no thanks. And I was like, you'd rather be in the rain, this is Portland, Oregon, in the rain, than in a safe, warm shelter. And now I'm like, oh, yes, this tracks. How many things have I given up that I should have not because I wanted to stay with my crew, with my people, belong, be loved? So, that's belonging, inclusion. But there's five more. The second one is improvement and progress. This one I was like, hmm, this is interesting. Meaning, do we have a sense that something important to us, our career, our family, our home life, something important to us is getting better or that we're part of it getting better? We see a sense of improvement or progress in our lives. So when I first learned about this, um, the psychology behind it, I instantly was like, I think this could be helpful for one of the teams I'm helping, who uh, I saw as actually doing really good things, but they were constantly talking in circles in every meeting. And they would complain, being like, oh, here we are again at the same thing. And so I said, okay, let's make this visual. Let's make all the things, the conflicts that you're having, the, the discussions, the arguments about how to do, let's make it visual. This is not a picture of them, but this kind of gives you an idea of what, what we did. We're going to turn everything into a sticky. Every issue that you haven't resolved, any decision that you're still arguing about that's controversial, turn it into a sticky, everything. We're just going to put it on there. And every time we have a meeting, you have to refer to the stickies. And if it's not up there, you have to write it down. And then if we ever resolve one of these issues or we decide to, like, yes, we're going to try this thing for three months, we're going to move that over to another wall. Like, that's the resolved issues wall. And we're just going to see how we're doing. Are we truly running in circles? One, by making it visual, by the way, it's always helpful for humans, right? That's helpful. And two, one of the things they instantly saw was that no more feeling like there was that like running in circles thing. They were like seeing, well, actually, we get through issues a lot. We just, right, there's always a new issue. <laughs> but actually, and also we're making progress. Both things can be true. So I was like, okay. Some folks have also found that you can do a similar thing, improve performance and work satisfaction by just journaling about your work day every day. 10 minutes. That's it. That's tapping into this. So that's the second one. The third one is my favorite. Very biased towards it. The third need is choice. Freedom. Decision-making power over something that matters to you. So what I, when I learned about this, uh, it explained a lot of how my past work experience had been. This is me if you give me a lot of choice in my work day. <laughs> Slaying the day. I'm just like, I can do this all day. Give me something more work, yes. I, you know, like, I'm just so pumped. Versus in the job that I had where they took all choice away, or I had very little, like I had a data entry job once where they were just like, just enter the data or uh, just show up and fill out this report. No, you have ideas? We don't want to hear them. Just do it. Sometimes they would pay $5 more an hour, that job, and I lasted still three days. Because this is me in those moments. <laughs> you can force me to do it. I might do it for a few days, but you're going to kind of drag me through it, and I won't last. Oh, the other kitty's just so confused. Oh. That's me, I'm the black cat. Yeah, so later once I realized this, every time I got a new boss, on like day one or first one-on-one, -on -one, I was like, three things you should know about me. <laughs> one is I do really well with some choice and freedom, and I'll push back and I'll try to, you know, like this works really well for me, and here's the areas where I currently have it that I do well. You should know this about me. My bosses are always like, what? I thought we would just talk about like what you do on the weekends or like how you're like in the job. And I was like, you should just know this about me. Uh, and two, you know, two, this is my number one thing. And three, this is my number one thing. I just, I can do anything else. This really matters to me. 
So hence why, by the way, I'm an entrepreneur now. I'm like, got it. Let's not subject bosses to that, right? I can just be my own boss. OK, that's me. But they also found this can be in small ways. One of the studies I found is that uh, senior citizens in senior citizen homes, so nursing kind of care homes, that were given more choices about, for example, how they decorated their rooms, what kind of plants they got, right? how they took care of their plants, that kind of thing. They had better health outcomes. Just because your room is your home, right, in a nursing home. And to have some choice is actually a lot versus the ones who were like, oh, we'll just make decisions for you because you don't have to worry about them. Always, always will care to some degree about this, to some degree. OK, that's three. Ah, this one, obviously, is, I'm guessing, this room's favorite, one of the, your favorites, which is equality, fairness. Before I did this work, I've always cared about fairness. I've always been uh, an activist. I've always cared about equality. However, I always thought of it as a political preference or like a just talking politics or philosophy or something. And then I learned that, in fact, it's one of the core needs. Evolutionary or brains or amygdala wired to always be scanning for it. So for example, uh, a very famous study now, not my research, really brilliant folks' research, um, they took some monkeys. Here's my monkeys. You can kind of see on the right, on the left, two different cappuccino monkeys. Adorable little, little guys. Both of them are taught a trick. When they get a pebble and they give the pebble back, they get a reward. In phase one, they got a cucumber, which you can see here in the bottom. Little pieces of cucumber. And the monkeys just like scarfed it up. They were like, yeah, cucumber, cucumber, yeah. Great. Super happy with the cucumber. In phase two, they changed it. And the monkey on the right, they're both female monkeys. It's not relevant, but if you hear me using pronouns. That's the monkey on the right, when she did the trick, in phase two, she got a grape, which is glucose. Just like for us, glucose is considered by the brain to be a better reward, because technically in nature, it's more rare. So the monkey on the right is like, we've upgraded to grapes. This is so good. But the monkey on the left sees this and is like, oh, we've upgraded to grapes, except when she did the trick, she still got the cucumber, which she was perfectly happy with before. This happened just twice. They did the trick twice. The monkey on the left is like, why well, I'm seeing a pattern that I'm not getting the grape, no matter what. How might we feel if we're doing the same work as someone else, but always getting the crappier reward? Maybe our face on the outside for a second is like, but the monkey did, I think, what a lot of us uh, might relate to. Let me get out of the way so folks can see it. Gets the cucumber. Oh, hell no. <laughs> so this is not looped. Monkey on the right does the trick. Gets the grape. Monkey on the left gets the pebble now is not sure if she's going to do the trick. She's thinking about it fine, gets the pebble back, gets the cucumber again. <laughs> not looped. Refuses, won't even eat it. Yep. So satisfying, right? <laughs> she's like, yeah, chuck it out. So that's what we mean by the brain is scanning for fairness. Now, some folks here get curious, wait, does the monkey on the right have any thoughts about this? Is she experiencing a threat to her fairness? In future studies, what they found, <clears throat> here we go, is that when they gave them a little hole or like a mesh so that if they wanted to, the monkey on the left, 70-ish percent of the monkeys would actually every now and then share the grape with the other one. But not all of the monkeys did. We're not sure why. Some of the monkeys did. A lot of the monkeys did. What we know, of course, about humans, I don't need to tell you this. It's a good reminder. But yes, we often feel that a threat to someone else's right, sense of equality is a threat to us, too. Or for whatever reason, we're willing to do a lot. This is my city, Portland, Oregon. This is, I think, June 3rd, 2020. George Floyd protests, folks laying down for nine minutes on 
It's a very iconic bridge. Yeah. None of these folks knew George Floyd, I'm pretty sure. Right? Humans in close relationship and even in like a global kind of affinity absolutely scan for fairness in many ways, not just fairness for themselves. So that's that one. So when I started thinking about these, I realized, oh, not only does this make me rethink that uh, my sense of fairness, me caring about it, isn't just politics, it's evolution, which is fascinating, but also it helps me realize that there's a way to define equality. There's lots of ways to define equality and fairness, but maybe one of them is who has to fight twice as hard to get their core needs met? based on things that have nothing to do with their actions, like race, gender, age, right? That is one way of defining equality, is who's just not getting the same access to their core needs, which are core. So that's one way also that we can define it, not just what the monkeys do. Okay. So, the fifth one is very, very relevant. It's predictability, a sense of certainty. Now, humans do not want 100% certainty about the future. When we have that, we get bored and we also wilt. But we need some level of certainty about the future. Uh, obviously, a few years ago, all of a sudden, not only did we not understand what kept our bodies healthy, right? all of a sudden, that was incredibly uncertain. Now we no longer were certain also about what our work was like, what our home lives were like. We never knew day to day, especially those of you who are caretakers, right, for other folks, including kiddos. We couldn't even predict how we would get to connect with other humans. And so I knew I had a coaching client who uh, very much, part of her identity was that she could deal with anything. She worked in emergency services um, for a large hospital, so like, the emergency services for the ER, you know, like that level of emergency. And she just was like, anything comes my way, I'm the person that always knows what to do. And then we had a coaching call in, uh, I think, July of 2020, and she was like this. <laughs> just like, I can't handle one more unknown in my life right now. She was just, she So one way to think about the core needs is that one of them you really need a lot of. For me, it's choice. You need a lot of it. But to all, for all of them, you need a certain level. And if you dip below your personal threshold, things get really hard. And she, during the pandemic, right, she dipped below even her very low threshold of predictability. Yeah, that happens. And so one of the reasons why I think a lot of us were thrown off kilter and still are, right, for years, is that maybe we always didn't have to think about that core need or certain core needs. We just depended, but they were just free-flowing. Maybe you had tons of friends, never thought about it, tons of belonging, and then all of a sudden, none of them. So core needs can also compound, right? Threats to them can compound. <sighs> okay, and last one, significance purpose. This one is the reason probably y'all are have the job that you have. It's because in your job, you know that whatever hard things happen, you get to do some good that day. And that is why you do the job you do. Some of you have given up higher paying jobs, right? Slash the nicer house, the nicer car, you've given up some things because you're like, because significance, yes. That is your brain being very healthy and very, very normal. For some of you, however, you get significance maybe from work, but also through spirituality, religion, which is why when you take away people's right to their spirituality and religion, you're essentially taking away their right to that source of significance. What is my purpose on this universe? My spirituality, my religion provides that for me. That's why that matters so much to us, right? And we're willing to give up a lot so that we can practice our religion or spirituality. It provides it. For some of you, you also do volunteer work. You give to charitable organizations. That's all part of that. 
my significance. Maybe it also provides a sense of fairness, right, that you're contributing towards it, yes, but also sometimes you're just like, I just want to know that I was significant on this earth when I was on this earth. And being loved is slightly different. Because these folks, right, if you contribute to, this is uh, one of the folks that I have a lot of uh, affinity towards, uh, Amazon indigenous folks who are fighting to keep their land. I've never met them. Is it unfair? Yes. Does that call to me? Yes. But also, I, to me, the Amazon is significant, and I want to be part of that significance right? by contributing what I can. We all have those connections. So, by the way, these are in the order, not technically that they matter, but so that you might remember them. Biceps. So now you're like, biceps. So again, they're not in the order. Not in the order for everyone. You might have your own order. So that brings me to the next quiet reflection, which is this. Thinking back on that great moment at work, which core needs might have been met in that moment? And now you're like, ah, oh. it wasn't just serendipity. It was also that these things lined up for me. So take a moment to do that now. Write that down. You have some room for that. Again, no need to share this with anyone if you don't want to. It's your own private note. So around this point is usually when people start getting really curious and asking questions. And one of the ones I get the most is this one. All well and good when my core needs are met, or my most important core needs are met, but what if, is there, is there something unique if a core need is repeatedly threatened? Again and again. Right? Say that at work, people say certain things, do certain things that after a while, again and again, you realize you're being left out. Yeah. By the way, that awe oh, feeling that you're feeling, that's your mirror neurons doing empathy. You didn't have to know anything. You just saw the image and you're like, I know that feeling whether it was in kindergarten, whether it's recently, what if, again and again, you keep having this feeling, right? Well, let's go back to our brain. We know that the PFC, right, the amygdala, so if the amygdala keeps picking up on this threat, it means that the amygdala starts training itself to always be in high alert mode. It's always trying to figure out if it needs to fight, flee, whatever. Always, 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 always which means that the PFC should be getting as much resources as it can because we're at work, right? We need our PFC, but in fact, it's getting limited resources because so many of them are going for the amygdala, which is like, <laughs> So you may not be getting to do your best work because, right, PFC. But the other reason that this matters is because every time a core need is threatened, again, it could be food, shelter, belonging, these other things, to the brain, it's always trying to balance all of them. When a corneal is threatened, as soon as that happens, when we say that the amygdala, right, is activated, it's another way of saying your whole body and mind are going into a stress state. Stress state is actually helpful in that a bunch of like adrenaline, uh, neurochemicals, all kinds of hormones are kicking into action so that you can take action. That's a stress state. It's good because it kept us alive. However, if you don't have a way of fixing that threat, of getting away from it, right? we stay in a stress state. And some of you know a lot more about this than I do. What happens if you stay in a high stress state? Is there, are our bodies wired to stay with all that adrenaline and hormones pumping through them? 
Now they are meant to flee from it so that we can return to equilibrium. In fact, what happens is inflammation in the body. And those of you who know about this more than I do, what happens if then that continues? Immune system starts being worn down. And what happens if your immune system gets worn down? You get sick, which means lower life expectancy. And we see this. If this continues and you aren't able to address that core need threat, and you just get used to having this inflammation in your body, heart disease, cancer, all kinds of things, you're more likely. So when I learned this, as a manager at the time, I had, a, I think, a, a team of six. I remember that every now and then they would come to me being like, hey, I'm you know, concerned that this isn't fair, that we're doing this, or like, hey, we keep changing this, and I, I don't know, predictability, right? All of a sudden I was like, wait, as a manager, I started getting kind of jaded of being like, take a number, you know, like, what else is wrong, you know? <laughs> but all of a sudden I was like, this is fascinating in that if this continues for this person, right, in particular inclusion, it means that no longer am I just hearing a complaint. Essentially, inclusion is a matter of both mental and physical health. And so there are many psychologists and neuropsychologists that believe that inclusion, though it's always balancing the six, inclusion for the majority of humans is always number one. Always number one. And so it's a particular one to stay focused on. Now, many of you are in this work because you intuited that. You're like, you don't need to tell me about the neurochemistry of it. I feel it in my bones that inclusion matters so deeply. But now you got the science backing you up to be like, oh, it's not just inclusion feels good. Inclusion is required for a healthy life healthy long life. So, which leads me to the second question that I often get. I had myself, which is this one. Okay then, how do I do inclusion? <laughs> because I understand now that this intensity, the severity of the matter, what do we do? Because a lot of us uh, are more comfortable uh, in you know, we, we're not quite like the kumbaya, the huggy, touchy-feely, super sweet. That was me, by the way. I grew up um, working in places where emotions were not relevant. But damn it, we got the job done. A lot of it was in healthcare services. Uh, we are literally saving lives often every day. Uh, I had no training really for it. And I was still on there, on the floor, reviving somebody. And so for me, I was like, I don't have time for your feelings. I don't have time to hear about your weekend. We're doing critical work. There's never enough hours. Let's do it. And so this idea of like inclusion at work, I just was like, I don't, this is not my thing. How do, I, how do I do? Is there like other versions of it? Yes. So obviously, touchy-feely, yes, huggy. But there are many work environments that are touchy-feely and really huggy and also don't provide inclusion. So it's not required. I, I heard that, mmm, yep. So what is it? Obviously, I could do like 3,000 hours of workshops on what inclusion looks like on the element level, but I want to give you the ones that are the most impactful and require no new training on your part, which is? Actually, well, I'm going to ask you a question first. Think of a leader or a mentor that you've gone to work with in the past that just really seem to care about your core needs. And I want you to actually write down, but what did they do or say? What did they do or say? How did you know they cared about your core needs? Take a moment for that.
lot of you might notice, oh, maybe some of those folks that did this, not, some of them might have been very touchy-feely, some of them weren't at all, and yet they provided this. Uh, there was a, uh, when I, it was a smaller workshop uh, back in the, the pre-COVID days when I asked this question, and somebody just yelled out, oh my God, they just gave a damn about my corneas. <laughs> and I was like, yes, <laughs> but how did you know that? Yes, so I like that version of it too. Yeah, they, so how do we know when someone gives a damn about our core needs? So one of the things is that essentially they either grew up, they grew up as humans having this thing modeled for them so that they weren't tripped up by what some of us are tripped up by because a lot of us grew up not having things, certain things modeled for us. And so we trip up on specific things. And one of them is a, a, a slice of in-group bias, in-group and out-group bias, which is, there we go, uh, one, one way that we see in-group bias show up is whoever we consider in-group, the people who we probably grew up with, who's literally whose faces we learn to recognize first in the first year of life, um, the faces, the people that look and sound like uh, who early on we were told we could trust, that tends to be your in-group. In-group, uh, when they say something, our brains are essentially listening for which biceps they're talking about. Now, maybe you didn't know them as biceps, but your brain knew to scan because our brain considers them complex beings. With in-group members, the way we listen and pay attention to them is because we consider them to be complex human beings, we're always seeking to map their biceps, how, what's their thing. And so we listen for it without even thinking about it. We just do it. However, research shows that we don't do that if someone who is in our out group is talking to us or that we're just relating to. Maybe they're a coworker. Maybe we work with them every day. But if they're not technically our in-group and we, it wasn't modeled for us, it's more likely that essentially we're doing something called flattening or oversimplifying them. We're just like, oh, you're just gay. I'm straight. You're, the, you're my gay, gay coworker. Or like, oh, you're black. I'm Mexican. You're the black one. We're doing some version of that, unless we've been taught to do otherwise. Meaning that even if we think of biceps around them, some version of it, we just think of like some version of a stereotype, you know, like cats, cat culture versus dog culture, right? How many of you own a cat who is actually all they want is love and cuddles. <laughs> Instantly, you're just like, that's all she wants. That's her number one core need and her number two core need and her number three. As soon as you come home, she's like, on your face. And how many of you know dogs that you're, they're like, if you put me on a leash, I will kill you. <laughs> literally called leash aggression, right? For that particular dog, liberty, freedom matters a lot. Though we have stereotypes about cultures, we know that every individual really is an individual. And one of the ways we can consider them an individual is what are their core needs and how do those show up, right? But we don't do that by default if it wasn't modeled for us for our group. I know that for me, so I grew up in Mexico and in Southern California, uh, all Mexican family. I'm, I, you know, I'm Mexican myself. Like, like born there, grew up there. Oh man, this was not modeled. Constantly talking about outgroup members as like just the stereotype. So that when I moved to the States, uh, and all of a sudden in Southern California, I'm in second grade, and there's so many kinds of kids around me that I've never been around so many kinds of kids. And instantly my brain was just like, I don't know how to do anything besides just be like, oh, you're wearing that. You must be super religious and, and creepy to talk to, and you're doing that, and you must be this way, and you must be a criminal. Your parents must be poor. Like, right? I just, I didn't know how to do it. So that means it was a little harder for me to do the basics that we can train ourselves to do, which is that when we are dealing with both in-group and out-group folks, knowing that like that's somewhere in there, I grew up with it, and so I might have to be more attentive that when someone right, who doesn't look or sound like me is talking to me, I actually like 
turn my PFC on, my prefrontal cortex, and I'm like, hey, listen for biceps, right? So if a, a report comes to me saying like, hey, they keep changing this thing and it's being really hard, I'm not just like, yeah, take a number, you know, or like, oh, this one again with predictability. I'm like, oh, wait, I wonder if predictability is really important to this person. Or I wonder if this is how predictability is really important to this person. Ah, oh, that curiosity is the PFC, but it's not always on. But we can turn it on. We can be like, PFC, I'd like to, to be curious, versus just like sit back for a second. And so when you ask questions, literally an open question, how is your project feeling, right? And they say, yeah, it's feeling good, it's feeling good. Are you like, cool, good to know, moving on. What did my voice say? You're not sure how to say, I'm not sure how to say like, it's kind of sucking real hard, and I don't really know how to say it in a polite way. Or I'm not, I, don't, I don't know if it's safe to tell you in the way that this project is sucking for me right now, right? So we listen not just for which bicep, but also like, oh, when might there be a bicep to kind of listen in on? And be like, oh, well, so this is one of my favorite ones that I stole from another uh, manager. When you get a vibe that maybe the person's not sure how to say, talk about their biceps. Okay, uh, you know, our next one-on-one, -on -one, let's do a quick little huddle. What's one thing, right, that's feeling good, but what's one thing that we could improve on that would make X thing better for you or better for your team? I saw this from a manager that I had for three months. I only had this manager for three months, and it was his first one-on-one. -on -one. Is at least once a month, I'm going to ask you that question. It's my question. It's really helpful. And I'm not going to, I won't settle for, everything's great, because that's work. No, it's not. What can we always, I might not always be able to do something about it, but if I know about it, at least I can start thinking about how I might support it. So then I started using it with my teams. It's like, helpful, expect this. But then I took it to like a new nerdy level. And I started later using this one. It's long, so I'm gonna read it to you. So hey, welcome to my team. Da -da -da -da, some basic intros. So one thing you should know about me as a manager is there's these six core motivators that I learned about, or now teach people about, but that really matter to me. Share the link, by the way, can't see it, but it's just, you can just look up my name and biceps. It's like the first thing that comes up. So, okay, share the link, be like, here it is. At our next one-on-one, -on -one, I would love to hear, which is feeling good, which we can improve on, and just expect that question from me again and again. It's one of the ways that on this team, we, we, we talk about it, we like codify what's going on. In the beginning, especially with folks that came from maybe toxic workplaces, really unsafe workplaces, I know that they were going to be real quiet and really chill and not have a lot to say. That's fine. It might take time for them to realize, I really can say that thing. It's true. But other people are just coming and being like, I love it. Great. You know, yes, this thing sucks. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> great. So but then for those of you ready to up the ante, one of the things I started incorporating into the teams that I was coaching was something called a biceps check. You can do biceps checks also about policy, major decisions, but you can keep it really just in the team too. A bicep check is, you know, obviously this is just as easy virtual as in person. Essentially, you as the leader person uh, can be like, hey, once a quarter, twice a year, whatever it is, once a month, we're gonna do a biceps check. Take two minutes. Quiet time. Nobody talk. Quiet time. Two minutes to write down which bicep has felt good this quarter and what is an example of that for you. So not just like predictability, inclusion, but like how did that show up for you? Because that's, that's the details that matter. It's ah, oh, that's what kind of belonging matters to you. Good to know. Right. Everyone after the end of two minutes, then you just go, I just go alphabetical by first name to keep it simple and predictable. Alphabetical by first name, two minutes each. I grab my phone and I start a two minute timer. Two minutes. Quick. After a while, the team gets very good at being efficient at using their two minutes and you get a lot, a lot in those two minutes. So each person goes, right? They're like, this person is like, well, this was me, da 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 da. Then the next person, the next person, you just keep going all the way around. Great. At the end, everyone, 
I usually, as a manager, say, take notes in case maybe someone said a thing that you're like, hey, me too. Or like, whoa, you figured that out? That's working for you this month? I'm going to find you afterwards because I have the same issue, but you're getting that core need met through, OK. Great. And then now let's repeat which bicep is maybe needing more support, not feeling great. We may or may not be able to do anything about it as a team, me as your leader, but we, if you feel safe talking about it, we'd like to know. Now, many people will share something personal, like uh, one of my parents is not doing well, and I'm doing the night shift with my, for my sisters, because they've got kids, I don't, and so if I'm not totally with it, that's going on, and I have to say, my sense of predictability feels really thrown off by it. Nothing for y'all to do anything about, just know that if I'm off, that's why. Good thing to know that this person is experiencing this and otherwise in a very, very busy, highly urgent kind of environment may not have known when to sneak that in and be like, hey, heads up, right? So yeah, go around, everyone does it. Now, the nice thing is there are times when, for example, I had a report that said, um, I don't know if this is, which core need this is, but uh, I've recently been diagnosed with ADHD um, it's making a lot of sense why certain things are hard. And since uh, COVID started and now everything's moved to Slack or texting each other, we're no longer using our ticketing system. And the ticketing system turns out is how my entire brain felt sane because I could track things. And now you're just texting me and I think I'm going like a little bit like mad in my brain because I don't know how to track it. And all of us were like, oh, why are we using Slack? and text to track things that we need from you. Anyone? And everybody was like, I don't know. And I was like, how does everyone feel about going back to the ticketing system when you need something from B? And people were like, feels great, actually. That's a good idea. I kind of miss the ticketing system. And I was like, OK. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned this. I'm not also sure which coordinate that was. Happy to talk about it afterwards. But I'm so glad we caught this. Thank you. Got it, got it, got it, got it. So I'm a fan. Uh, I do mine, I think, uh, quarterly. I think we're on a quarterly. I also love that it's the things that it's nipped in the bud. Whew. And also, I love, uh, Daniel mentioned that some of the key words around today were like honesty, vulnerability, and I was like, yes! Because that is what it's training your team to be like, it's safe to do that here. It's safe to do that here. It's safe to do that here. But that's only true if you do the third thing well. And that's listen. Uh, I thought I was a great listener. <laughs> uh, and then I asked two coworkers that used to be my reports and no longer were, so they were safe to tell me. And I was like, hey, like on a scale of one to 10, you know, maybe at lunch, any thoughts on like, this is a weird question, but my listening skills, 10 being like an amazing listener, and one was not when I was your manager. And they're like, sure, yes, or next one to one. I already knew I was like, oh, get ready for it. So, you know, they, yeah, they were like, you're like five or like a four if you're really stressed out and you often are. Again, you know, community healthcare, stressful job. I was like, Four and a five? Okay. And one of the things I learned that I was doing wrong is I never slowed my brain down. And I mentioned this to my then manager, who was an amazing listener. I was like, hey, this is weird, but like, do you feel like when I come to you with like a thing that you, is your brain like still in like fast mode from, you know, just working this clinic? But this thing about slowing down that I was reading about, and she was like, yeah, I guess I never thought about that. I, I guess I, I mean, how can you not? And I was like, I don't think I do. I realized that when someone came to me with like a thing that I was like, oh, they're going to need a thing for me, right? You know that feeling when you're like bracing yourself for one more thing from somebody else? I was breathing really shallow. So I'm going to exaggerate it because some of you are far away. But imagine if you come to me and you, it took you days or months to figure out how to say a thing to me or request a thing from me. Really, it was a really hard thing to come to me about. 
And as you're telling me, I'm like this. Hmm? How listened to do you feel? Some part of your biology understands I'm not really with you. I'm either thinking about myself, whatever's going on. And so one of the things I was taught by expert listeners was like, whoa, when you notice that someone might be sharing something that matters to them, notice where your breath is. Is it right here in shallow or is it deep? And I just did it. I just breathed deeply. It doesn't have to be like, like yogi breath. Go on. <laughs> Not, it's really good for yoga. I often do this. Oh, yes. And I, I like nod with my breath. The nodding reminds me. That's it. Breathe. And to start as you breathe, noticing what their face is doing. Because there's something called microexpressions. <laughs> microexpressions are essentially tell us, uh, rather give away how we're feeling. Nobody has a poker face. I know you think you knew, but you don't. You have these microexpressions that you can't help but control, and we can get good at reading them. You don't need to take a workshop on it. Just start noticing. Does this person look like they're feeling listened to? And that way you'll be like, no, I guess they don't. And that will tell you. Because <clears throat> one of the things I learned about both how you ask a question and then how you react when they start answering the question, right, the listening skills, is that there's a difference between saying you do a thing and doing it right. <laughs> really. <laughs> like, really. And so if you're not sure how your asking skills and then your listening skills are, one, I really recommend these two books. Uh, one of them, it's called Motivational Interviewing for Leadership. Those of you who are trained in motivational interviewing, it's a book about management and leadership and coaching, using that model, and it's brilliant. And also the coaching habit. Either of them, I don't get paid for this. I just, they're the two that I find is very um, easy to dive into. They taught me a lot, a lot. I also then went and took a, a, like a one-day coaching class, and that also taught me a lot. <sighs> okay, so... After, you still have time you know, afterwards, at some point, I want you to take time for yourself to think about, is there anything we talked about so far that you could incorporate into how you deal with coworkers, with stakeholders, with your team, if you have a team? Especially the first and the third. Really. There's really good listeners, and they're rare. They're rare. So regardless of what kind of work environment you have, this has been shown to be the most impactful. Now, this gets me to the last and final question, which is this one. What if someone brings to me a thing and it's a threat that's outside of my control? Oh. The nice thing is, <clears throat> I know that this is true, will always be true, because you know it better than anyone else. Maybe there's a policy. The policy is threatening their core need or their community's core need, and you don't have access to how that policy changes. Maybe there's decision makers you don't have access to. Maybe there's a whole system, or many systems, layers of system. The good thing is what we know about humans is that when people describe who their favorite leaders, coworkers, mentors are, it's not the people that gave them everything they want to add. It's really not. It's, in fact, the people that use allyship behaviors, which you have a panel about, which is so cool that you just dig in deeper into that. When we talk about allyship, we're talking about how do I support someone, even if I'm their leader, their coworker, whatever it is, when their core needs are being threatened and I don't get to just flip a switch. Right? But if you can, one of the things that I have found really useful is problem-solving questions. Right. I was taught the, one of the most magical things you could ever say to somebody who's feeling a core need threatened is like, what would feel most helpful right now? 
simplest question. We just disregard it. But it puts everything right. It makes it about us, which is really helpful. Let's say, <clears throat> right, that you can do something. You can say, hey, do you want to brainstorm options? If you're their manager leader, you should say, how about we brainstorm options? How about in a few days? Take time, what might be helpful, and I'll bring something to the table too. It's not about you fixing everything. It's about you involving the person, being like, I care about this because I see you care about it. Let's figure this out or see what we could do. Because then my next favorite question is often this one, which I stole from another coach. What would help make this at least 10% better this week? If I see that for this person, it's an acute situation, like this is urgent now, this seems like I'm throwing them a bone. I'm not. I'm acknowledging that life is complicated, and I may not have a magic wand. But actually, this makes the problem chunkable. That's a word, chunkable. OK, it's a huge problem. What would make it? And the things that people have answered are fascinating. Sometimes they're like, honestly, we can just check in about it next week. I'm like, I'm going to do that. Yes, yes, I can do that. Sometimes they're like, I don't know, could I get an extra hour this week off the floor? Yes, I can figure that out. Let's talk to so-and-so. Right. What is this tapping into, by the way? There's a core need that that last question is tapping into. Improvement, progress, predictability. You're saying, I can't make everything predictable. I can, make t can we make 10%? You're also saying, progress, not perfection. Can we make a little progress on this for you right now? What can we do right now? Tapping into lots of things, obviously, as well as inclusion, because you're given a day out. <laughs> That's one way we do that. So your closing reflection, I think, yes, two minutes? OK, great. Do it fast. I know that there's things I said that you're like, yes, I knew that, or I intuited it. There you go, science. Note those, because you already have them in your body you knew. And also, what did you learn? Is there a thing you might try committing to practicing? Some of you, by the way, will first start committing to practicing using biceps or asking about biceps to your kids at the dinner table. That counts. Especially if they're teenagers, it's fascinating what they say. It will change the dynamic. Yeah. So do that. Because the thing I want to leave you with is this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. Some of you know it, which is that ships are safe in harbor. That is not what ships are built for. That is humans. Yes, technically, it would be ideal if all of our core needs were met all the time. But we are built, we are built to withstand lots of things. And the research says that yes, one, inclusion is a matter of health, yes. But also, inclusion is what builds resilience. The people who uh, rate their sense of belonging the highest also weather storms the best, i.e. more resilient. So when you work on inclusion, you're working on the other core needs in case those get threatened because that will buffer them. This is humans. And we know, I know, that you already have inclusion as a skill set. You know how to do this. The thing is, how might we build policies, decisions, and everyday behaviors so that we're just providing that equitably? That's the question. You know how to do it. Now we're just making sure we're not missing anyone. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. So good to be with you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for flying all the way here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to transition. Um, I, I just wanted to make a note. I was thinking about the biceps. You know, one of the observations I had was, all of those are felt experiences, not forced ones, right? We get to determine for ourselves when we feel like we belong, when something feels predictable, when we feel like there's improvement possible or happening, right? As people leaders, teams I work with, uh, the, the hope, the wish, the dream is always that we could tell people they belong 
Did you not see the executive memo? We sent that out. <laughs> Don't worry. Y'all belong, right? Uh, but, but you know, as well as I do, it's a felt experience. And I love that she brought it back to listening at the end, right? We, we can ask the questions, but if we're not ready, able, and willing to listen to the answers that aren't going to be easy or simple, right? We're not going to be able to, to deliver the environment that each one of our team members needs to be able to experience for themselves those six core needs. We're not just trying to change people's hearts, right? We're, we're trying to help people rewire their brains. I want to share quickly my really good day at work, right? Remember how she started that? My really good day at work? About an hour ago, Demita Brown said I'm awesome. <laughs> so uh, that hit core, uh, core need number one for me, belonging, uh, and number six, significant and purpose. So thank you. Uh, I had a felt experience. Hey, we're going to take a break for 10 minutes. We're going to start right at 10.15. There are hors d'oeuvres in the other room. Grab some food. Take a bio break if you need to. There's a 360 camera and a step and repeat. We've got photographers all over the place. Have fun connecting for the next 10 minutes. We'll see you back in here for a 10-15 mayor's panel. Thank you.